Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Mike Savilla, and I am the president of the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians. I apologize for not being able to join you live for this program today, but I do bring greetings from our over 5,000 members, including practicing physicians, family medicine residents, and medical students. Our program today is the Ohio Supreme Court Candidate Forum. We're pleased that the four candidates for the Ohio Supreme Court this fall will be joining us, moderated by David Puragas. You can always catch this program again at our website, ohioafp.org. And just to let you know, this program is also being live streamed on our Facebook page and also on our YouTube page. I hope you enjoyed today's program. I will turn things over now to our moderator. Welcome to the Ohio Supreme Court Candidate Forum. Thank you, Dr. Savila. Uh, my name is David Paragas, and I serve as the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians lobbyist. And I cannot tell you how excited I am that we've been able to pull together this forum of our Supreme Court candidates. In Ohio, I consider ourselves very lucky. Um, we have a judiciary that is one of the highest caliber in the country, whether it's at the municipal court level, the common pleas level, the court of appeals level, or the Supreme Court. I'm lucky to have served as a member of the Ohio Bar for over 30 years and have appeared before just about everyone um, on this panel, except I don't believe I've had an opportunity to appear before uh, Judge O'Donnell in uh, Cuyahoga County. But I do know them and I can tell you we are very lucky in Ohio because not only do they epitomize um, the highest character of the courts in our country, but they care deeply about the institution of the judiciary. So for today, what we hope to do is to give you a glimpse on who they are, how they feel they can best serve Ohio on the Supreme Court, and give you an idea of what's at stake moving forward in the state of Ohio. Um, what I will do today is give them an opportunity each to talk about their background and why they want to serve on the court. And then I've prepared uh, a dozen or so questions that we will alternate asking them to give us their responses, which I hope will give you an idea on who they are. Um, we will also field questions from you in the audience, um, but I must remind you that candidates for the judge, for judges in the state of Ohio, cannot make pledges or promises of conduct in office other than the faithful and impartial performance of their duties of the office. They can uh, not announce their views on a disputed legal or political issues or on something that is likely to come before them on the court. So with that, I may need to um, screen through some of the, uh, your questions so that we can um, have an appropriate response. And um, I did receive a note that people cannot hear me. Is that any better? Can you hear me? Yes, okay, great. I'm gonna turn up my volume a little bit. Okay, I hope that's a little bit better. Great. I would like to this time um, introduce Justice Sharon Kennedy. Justice Kennedy was elected to the Ohio Supreme Court in 2014, and she is seeking her second full term. Previously, Justice Kennedy served as a domestic relations judge on the Butler County Court of Common Pleas, where she was the administrative judge. Prior to completing law school at the University of Cincinnati College of Law, Justice Kennedy served as a police officer with the Ham Hamilton Police Department. Throughout her career, she has served numerous not-for-profit boards and has been active in her community. And I would this time ask Justice Kennedy to talk about her desire to continue to serve on the Ohio Supreme Court.
I'm so sorry to interrupt. Justice Kennedy, I think you're on mute. <laughs> we got this, guys. <laughs> so thank you, David, for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you to the Academy and for all the physicians and those of your staff for the gift of healing and health that you give to Ohio families. Thank you for tuning in today. I would ask for your endorsement this year and thank you for your past endorsement. You know, I began running for the court in 2012 with one vision, one mission. That is to ensure that the individual who served at the Ohio Supreme Court as the 154th justice would do so by exercising judicial restraint. As an organization, as medical providers, as voters, it is that system of judicial philosophy that best serves our tripartite system of government of th three separate but co-equal branches. If you have an individual who serves at the court exercising judicial activism or flexibility where they choose a winner or loser at the end of the game, it's at the stake of the rule of law. It's stability and predictability. I have 34 years of diverse service in the justice system. I began my career as a police officer in the city of Hamilton, left law enforcement to pursue law school, served as a law clerk in the general division, engaged in private practice for eight years, 14 years on the trial court, and now in my eighth year as a justice. Through my work at the court, you can see someone who does not just speak about judicial restraint, but exercises judicial restraint as well. But serving as a justice is more than just that. It's also the work you can do beyond the bench. For myself, it's my statewide initiative called Lean Forward, advancing the treatment for our veterans. With the sixth largest veterans population in the United States of America, we find them within the criminal justice system and make sure that they're attaining substance abuse, mental health treatment, but we're also working on other programs, whether that's answering the call for disabled American veterans with a continuing legal education program, helping those find access to justice by giving those courts the tools they need to help individuals enter into the system. So my goal in remaining the 154th Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court is to continue the important work of the court and the vital work that I do beyond the bench. Thank you for the opportunity to be with all of you. Thank you, Justice Kennedy. Uh, now it's my uh, privilege to introduce Judge John P. O'Donnell, who has been serving as a judge in the Court of Common Pleas in Cuyahoga County since 2007, and previously served from 2002 to 2005. He has over a dozen years of experience in private law practice, and prior to being admitted to the bar, he was an insurance adjuster. He is a graduate of the Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and he has served on numerous boards, including the Commission on Prof Professionalism, the Ohio Supreme Court. Judge O'Donnell, thank you for um, participating today. Judge O'Donnell, I believe you, your mic might be muted. Your Honor, we're, we're having difficulty with your audio. Um, with your permission, could we uh, 
jump to Justice Judy French and come back to you and, and try again? Sure, please do that. Can you hear me now, though? We can hear you, so please proceed. That's perfect. Thank you. Oh, no, we lost you again. With the permission of the court, I will jump to Justice French if, if we could, and then, Your Honor, we'll come back to you in a moment. At this time, uh, I would love to introduce Justice Judy French, who became a justice on the Supreme Court in 2013 and was elected for a full term in 2014. Prior to her appointment to the Ohio Supreme Court, Justice French served on the 10th District Court of Appeals where she authored over 800 opinions. Justice French has previously served as counsel to the EPA, as a section chief in the Ohio Attorney General's office, and as chief counsel to Governor Bob Taft. She is a graduate three times from The Ohio State University and was uh, appointed by Chief Justice uh, John Roberts to serve on the Federal Appellate Rules Committee. Justice French, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Great, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you to the Academy and to everyone joining. And thank you so much for organizing this effort. I was very grateful to get the support of the Academy in 2014, and I would be honored to have your support again in 2020. For nearly eight years now, I've served with a guest with the Neural Supreme Court. And in that time, I've considered thousands of cases, participated in oral arguments, and written legal opinions. Uh, we hear every type of legal case that can arise in Ohio. And with that experience, I'm seeking another term on the court. But I've also been busy with service away from the court. Since becoming a justice, I've traveled to all 88 counties in Ohio a number of times. In an effort to better understand the legal needs of Ohioans, I meet with civic organizations, businesses, elected leaders, educators, health professionals, and individuals. And that foundation of information helps inform my decisions about what cases we should accept to decide and my understanding of the impact of the opinions we issue. Before becoming a justice, I served as a judge on the 10th District Courts, Court of Appeals, which hears appeals from Franklin County Courts and state administrative agencies. I formed a broad base of knowledge about legal issues, but I don't think it's enough to say that I served on that court and learned the issues. I also learned the importance of efficiency and clarity in writing legal opinions. And in my eight years on the court, as Dave said, I authored more than 800 legal opinions and worked day in and day out to issue my opinions in a timely way, but also those of my colleagues. Before becoming a judge, I had been a lawyer for 16 years. My experience as a lawyer spanned private law practice for public and private clients, corporate experience, and government expertise. And that breadth of experience taught me many things, but chief among them were two lessons. Number one, my clients and I wanted stability in the court system, especially in the Ohio Supreme Court. We wanted a court that would follow the law, not make it up or second guess policy decisions by the General Assembly. Many of you were likely in practice when a majority of the Ohio Supreme Court sought to undermine civil justice reforms. And so you understand the impact an activist court can have on health professionals and the patients you serve. It took many years to change the philosophy of the majority of the Ohio Supreme Court as one that respects the law. And my record as both a judge and a justice show uh, shows that I'm someone who follows and respects the law, regardless of my own personal views. But number two, my clients also wanted efficiency. One thing I hear consistently from lawyers on behalf of their clients is that they want our courts to be more efficient. I've been part of significant changes to make our court and the courts of Ohio more efficient to make the litigation process more streamlined for everyone and to make it less expensive for everyone. I'll continue to make judicial efficiency a priority in my next term. 
And finally, while my work on the bench is very important, my work off the bench is off is also important. I believe deeply in making sure our courts are open to everyone. I have been part of important reforms at the Ohio Supreme Court that have opened doors for underserved Ohioans, but there is more work to do. And in my next term, I'll keep working to ensure equal access to our ju justice system for everyone. So thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Justice French. David, I think I it's working now, but can you tell? Uh, we can hear you loud and clear, okay, I'm gonna keep yelling. but we can't see you now. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Thank you for your early introduction, and I apologize for the technical problems. I trust someone will uh, somehow notify me if this microphone goes out on me. I apologize for the green screen in the back. I'm in my makeshift Zoom studio, and StreamYard doesn't happen to take my uh, virtual backgrounds. So I want to say I'm glad to appear before the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians. I respect your specialty. Indeed, I count on your specialty to uh, make sure I don't have to see other specialists. In America and in Ohio, of course, we value both freedom and the rule of law. With freedom comes a significant amount of discretion and power. And the rule of law, it seems to me, exists to make sure that power is neither misused nor abused. Um, in our system, then, we have three co-equal branches set up to enforce the rule of law. Obviously, the legislature makes the laws, the executive enforces them, and the judiciary interprets them. Uh, but mostly, it seems to me, the function of the rule of law is to prevent an abuse of power. And so by way of an example, it is uh, known that uh, if you have a physically dominant husband in a marital relationship, he or she may be, he, I should say, may be prone to abuse that power. And so the legislature made it a crime to cause or attempt to cause physical harm to a family member. When a person is charged with committing that crime, it's up to the executive to enforce it. In that enforcement, which is litigation, you know, a criminal case, it's up to the judicial branch to make sure that the executive does not abuse its power and fairly and constitutionally prosecutes the individual. If those branches do not in good faith perform their functions, then our system is out of whack. So my view of the judiciary is that it needs to be a fully participating, independent, co-equal branch of government, keeping the other two branches within their constitutional constraints. I promise, however, no agenda on the Ohio Supreme Court other than to decide cases fairly, according to the record and the law, as I understand it. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Judge O'Donnell, and it's a pleasure to have you back. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Judge Jennifer Bruner. Uh, Judge Bruner currently is serving on the 10th District Court of Appeals and has served there since 2014. She's also served as a Franklin County Court of Common Pleas Judge from 2000 to 2005. She was the first woman elected to serve as Ohio's Secretary of State, where she served from 2007 to 2011, and she has 17 years of uh, private law practice. She is a graduate of Capital University Law School and has assisted foreign governments with judicial reform efforts, and I see that she has dropped off the call. <laughs> so if we could, I would just give her um, uh, 30 seconds to rejoin. And I'm going to email her. Oh, she is trying to sign it. Hello, Your Honor. Can you hear me, Judge Bruner? Yes, yes. I, I couldn't hear Judge O'Donnell and um, it was 
not seeing everything, so I thought I would try to log out and log back in to see if there was improvement. Well, you, you missed that marvelous introduction of I did I did of you. So, <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you very much. Are you ready? Yes, we are. Thank okay. you, Ron. Okay. Um, thank you all for having me today and having all of us today. Um, I have utilized a family physician since my 34-year-old son was born uh, back in 1986, starting with Ridge Welker in Columbus, Ohio. And um, I finally had to leave my family physician when he moved to um, Seattle, Washington to follow his children. Yeah. That was Perry, Perry oh. Mossoff. So I, I greatly appreciate the work that you do and um, you have taken as a as a profession, you've taken very good care of my family over the years. Um, uh, it was really great that all of us, because um, I have three children, and for a while I had three foster children, so it was great that sometimes um, five or six of us could show up at the doctor's office at the same time. And um, we knew our family very well and were able to provide us, I think, that extra amount of service that um, truncated or solid medical um, service just doesn't necessarily provide. So uh, by way of background, um, I currently serve actually in Judge Friend's old seat on the 10th District Court of Appeals. I did change the color of the office. She did have it a lovely blue, and I changed it to kind of a gold color. Um, the, uh, I've been serving on the court since uh, November of 2014 when I won that election by winning over the woman who was appointed to replace her. Uh, before that, I have been in private practice for over 17 years, starting my law practice in the corner of my bedroom when my children were seven, four, and two. And um, I served as a, a county common police court judge from 2000 to 2005. And during that time, started a felony drug court in Franklin County. It's called the TIES program, Treatment is Essential to Success. And I'm so pleased to know that it's still in operation today. Uh, much different. Um, much different focus with the heroin epidemic, which was just beginning in 2005 when I left the bench to run for Ohio Secretary of State. Uh, I served, I won that election. Um, unfortunately, I'm the first and only woman to serve in that office, but I served from uh, 2007 until 2011 and uh, supervised the election, uh, uh, first Obama election in 2008. Uh, during that time, my work and my staff's work was recognized with the uh, John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award, and uh, it was um, quite an interesting experience. So uh, my work on the 10th District Court of Appeals uh, is very good work, and it's at a good time in my career where sort of the arc of your experience can help inform your judgment. Um, I've been an attorney for 37 years, went to night law school, had my first child while I was in law school and working. And um, it, it, I have been uh, as well all over the state of Ohio and uh, worked closely with local officials all over the state because of my job as Secretary of State to supervise those elections. Um, my husband and I have been married for 42 years. Uh, we live in Columbus. We also have a farm in Columbiana County, um, not far where Justice French grew up. And uh, we have, uh, as I said, three, three grandchildren and five uh, any day, six grandchildren. One girl, five boys. Um, the oldest is eight. That's a girl, and all the rest go all the way down, starting at age six to almost born. Um, I uh, uh, I love it that I get the chance to sort of be in the rural life as well as enjoy city life. And um, on the Supreme Court, I would very much value the opportunity um, to be involved in deciding which cases the court reviews. Um, the efficiency of the court is important, but unfortunately, the number of cases that the court actually takes to review has decreased in the last uh, few years or so. It used to be uh, every seven out of 100, and now it's down to six out of 100. Uh, and, and it's good to be careful and to take the time, but access to justice also means the opportunity to be heard. Um, the Chief Justice and others on the court are involved with the Ohio Sentencing Commission in creating a database of sentencing and uh, other factors in the criminal justice system to try to um, actually sort of overlay that with demographic, demographic data that would help the court to help the judges around the state um, have more uniformity in sent sentencing and to recognize when there appears to be a racial difference or other types of demographic differences in sentencing. Um, as Secretary of State, I created 
a database of life quality indicators for the state of Ohio that was accessible online. And I, I hope to have the opportunity to contribute to that effort uh, for the benefit of the people of Ohio. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, uh, Judge Bruner, and it's a pleasure to have you here today. I love to uh, start with our open questions now, and the first set of questions will be directed to Justice Kennedy and Judge O'Donnell. Uh, the first question I have is, you know, over the last six months, Ohio, like the rest of the country, has suffered through the pandemic. People have lost access to their jobs, to health care, to education, and to everyday living. And in many cases, individuals have lost access to the courts. Justice Kennedy and Judge O'Donnell, how do we ensure that Ohioans during the pandemic or any crisis have continued access to the courts and we remove those barriers to protect their civil rights? Justice Kennedy, I'd ask you to respond to that. Well, David, it's a primary question that many individuals have asked across the state, and I would actually tell them to take heart that there are individuals at the Ohio Judicial Conference led by Executive Director, former Justice Paul Pfeiffer, that have been working with the trial courts to make sure not only are the doors open, but the people's cases are being heard. In that in May, when courts reopened, or as individuals started moving back across the, the state, judges were already working together to create a formalized checklist, working with their local health departments to actually put the pieces together of how they can reopen safely. Thinking about these things, how do we protect staff? How do we protect the parties who are entering the system seeking access? And how do we protect those who would be coming to help serve as jurors? In, in that partnership, there was a judge from Wood County, Judge Riger, who actually had worked overseas for a year internationally helping other foreign courts establish. Taking out that foreign checklist, they were actually able to use that checklist to actually put together a series of questions that judges and local health departments would answer and how to move forward with actually having individuals in court. That was one piece of it. The second piece was actually ramping up what we call this video technology. The Ohio Supreme Court opened up grant monies and allowed local courts to apply for that money so that they could actually come up with solutions. And here were some of the solutions they came up with. Some of them bought big screen TV so prospective jurors could be individually seated in different rooms with social distancing separated out so they could watch the voir dire going on. Some of them turned it into cameras and computers so that they could do what we're doing, teleconferencing for those hearings that really don't need in person, whether that's a scheduling conference or a pretrial, making sure that electronic entries are also going out. There is the whole, you know, Plato once said, uh, necessity is the mother of invention and certainly the pandemic was that. So as they looked at not only keeping the courts open, making sure that access was real, turning to technology, and now as you're moving forward, they have actually resulted in a webinar that's been played for judges across the state on two occasions. It's available at the Ohio Supreme Court website. So as judges find new challenges, they actually have resources in order to make sure that those cases and controversies are heard in real time. Thank you, Justice Kennedy. Judge Donald, um, similar to that question, and, and well, your your screen on my end uh, was uh, blocked there for a minute, but. Uh, Getting to the original question you asked, since March, I have been providing access to the courthouse in many new ways, as well as when necessary, the old ways. The first thing I want to say is that 
I will not require any person to be in the courthouse when it might be dangerous. Having said that, not everybody has access to a device where they can appear by Zoom or a similar uh, method. So some people do need to come to the courthouse. When they do, our court has established procedures to make sure that it is as safe as possible. Very, I think two people are allowed on the elevator at once. Any given floor of the courthouse only has two, opera, two court rooms operating at once, and one of those in the morning, one in the afternoon afternoon. We are awash in uh, hand sanitizer, masks, and gloves for those who may forget them and need them. Plexiglass barriers have been uh, put in throughout the courtroom in uh, what you might call the higher traffic areas. At the same time, we have done many things remotely, always with the clear knowledgeable waiver, particularly in criminal cases, by a defendant of his or her right to personally appear in court. So far, I have done everything by video except hold a trial. Uh, I have had bench trials, which were, of course, in court and with social distancing in place. So uh, these are things, by the way, that I think can stay in place even once the pandemic subsides or is under control because in many ways, I think we've increased access to justice or at least convenient access to justice. Many people who don't have the funds, it takes a lot for them to come down to court for a morning. If we can do their hearings remotely, either on their phone or from their lawyer's office, access to justice while not requiring people to be in the courthouse. So uh, I can report to you so far so good, and we're going to keep on working that way. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, next set of questions will go to Justice French and Judge Brewer. In the aftermath between the George Floyd and Brianna Taylor, this country has reported through very difficult emotion related to social inequality. Um, do you believe that there are of women and people of color in the No, we sorry, David, that we didn't get to hear your the end of your question. I'll ask the question again. And uh, do you believe that there is a underrepresentation of women uh, or people of color in the legal system? Um, how would you work to correct that problem? Well, thank you for that question, David. And I have to say that, uh, yes, in many ways, women and people of color are underrepresented in our judicial system. I have to say, though, uh, the number of women that I have worked with has been very high. Uh, when I left the 10th district, it was a court of half. Half of the judges were women. I've been, an, I've been part of a number of uh, female majorities at the Ohio Supreme Court. In fact, when I started at the court, there was a little sign in the conference room that said, uh, girls rule, uh, that happened to be on the side of the, the table um, that only the, men, only the men could see. So I think for many women, um, there is a sense of representation on the court and in, in an elected office. But that's certainly not true all around the state. When I go into more rural areas, there is an underrepresentation of people of color and women as lawyers. And of course, you have to be a lawyer in order to become a judge in the state of Ohio. So I, I think as I have uh, talked with individuals all around the state, what I have tried to do is be, be part of uh, making it easier to, uh, to get elected and to become uh, part of elected office 
in the state of Ohio and to bring attention uh, to those issues, both in terms of getting greater access to lawyers all around the state, uh, for example, in our rural areas, uh, some innovative ideas, for example, of the justice bus, of bringing more lawyers into rural Ohio and uh, more legal services in the state of Ohio. So I'm, I'm happy to see that we have um, made a number of inroads in the judicial system. But I think overall, what I, what I become most concerned about is just that perception of, of inequality. Uh, in the judicial system, whether based on socioeconomic status or on, on uh, color or nationality. And I support those changes and innovations that will help us be more transparent in the legal system, uh, whether it's the uniform sentencing database or other changes to bring uh, more data so that we know what we're doing uh, in terms of underrepresentation and dis disparate impacts in the judicial system. So I've worked hard toward access to justice, but I think there's a lot more that we can do. Thank you, uh, Justice French. Uh, Judge Bruner, um, do you believe that there is an underrepresentation of women and people of color in our court system? And what would you do to work to change that? If you want to talk about criminal defense, um, there is an overrepresentation of people cover color compared to the general population. Um, the number of women criminal defendants is less than what it is in the general population. Um, and when you're talking about the criminal justice system, I like to think um, back to my days of teaching law and ethics to law enforcement officers that the, the amount of discretion in the judicial system starts with the police officer on the street. And then it goes to the prosecutor, the public defender, um, defendants involved in making a decision on plea, and then it goes to the judge and then on to the appellate courts from that point forward. And um, in terms of officers on the street, um, I, I, there, are, there are more women than there were before, but there are an awful lot of men and there are an awful lot of white men. And um, when we look at what's occurred with um, today, one of the officers in the Breonna Taylor shooting is, is being indicted. Uh, we look at the George Floyd and so many of the other cases. Um, there, there needs to be a, a, a change in mindset. There needs to be a full examination from the street all the way to the highest court in the state of what we're doing and how it actually impacts people of color and women, LGBTQ, um, and even with the economic disparities as well. Uh, so the, uh, and I believe there's more than a perception of racism and I'll just focus on racism because a lot of it is baked into the process. And so just like in the pandemic where we've had to look uh, even as a campaign for the Ohio Supreme Court, uh, what we normally would do in a campaign, we've got to take every procedure, every step and examine it and say, in this different state, and right now I'm talking about compared to racism, this enlightened state of, and this, this greater awareness, is what we're doing actually the right to do, the most effective thing to do, and the safest thing to do to move us forward toward the goal of full, full equality. Um, I'm willing to make those examinations. Uh, I think this campaign has been a test for all of us in terms of how we campaign and are we willing to, to basically try new things so that we make sure that we are truly keeping people safe and we are truly providing justice. Thank you, Judge Bruner. My next question goes to all of you and anyone can respond or all of you can respond. I mean, I believe we're fortunate that our judicial candidates are elected on a nonpartisan basis, so not by party. Um, and I believe that that promotes more of a civil discourse on, on major policy issues. Um, yet when you look at our political races, the state house races, um, congressional races and the presidential race, um, we are certainly polarized as a country. How can we in the court system be a model for the rest of society to promote civil discourse? Anyone's free to answer that one. That's a free for all question. I'll say it. Um, the, the first thing, when I was um, having to think about what public service meant to me 
before I did my speech in Boston for the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award, I thought, okay, what are the goals that I have in public service? And that is to promote fairness, equality, and respect. And that respect piece goes to individual dignity of every human being. And uh, the civil discourse occurs when even when we agree to disagree, and you look at, at former Justices Scalia and Ginsburg, and they could be the best of friends, they could be civil and kind toward each other, but yet be on such polar opposites on the issues. And if we set that tone and we are making sure, for instance, in a decision that I would be doing writing, uh, I, I will not say that this lacks merit. Um, uh, and I will not, I try to even avoid using the word that they failed in their effort to try to convince us. Because if I, as a justice or a judge, show someone respect the, the chances are it would pass on. And when I was a trial judge, I only had two individual situations out of you know, five years where things ended up having, resulting in a takedown in the courtroom. Um, no matter how horrible the crime was that the defendant was charged with, I said good morning to them, sometimes watching just the absolute shock and surprise in their eyes. We can set the tone. Well, David, I'd like to jump in because going back to the original question of judicial candidates and their nonpartisan status and what can we demonstrate to others who run with party affiliation and the civil discourse and polarization that's happening right now, there are many who question whether or not there really is um, a lack of polarization in the judicial elections. You know, we do run nonpartisan. What the Pound Institute wrote about in 2003 is whether judicial independence is really um, capable of living in this current climate in our society, because those individuals who are running and or third party groups really are beginning to attack judges based on decisions that they make without full disclosure or conversation about the entire breadth of the case and what was really decided this, what I call the coming of um, civil discourse within judicial campaigns is really what I think the Ohio State Bar Association was trying to achieve with the Clean Campaign Pledge, saying that we are not going to engage in the polarized conversation or civil discourse that other elected officials do. That we're running nonpartisan means that I am not taking up for arm the platform of the Republican Party, even though I'm endorsed, because politics should never enter into my decision making. That really goes back to really why I'm running for the court in that continuum we call judicial philosophy. In making sure that I am exercising judicial restraint, I am making sure that there is no invasion into the judicial making process a party's platform, partisanship. But as we see America go, and you look at races occurring in other states, it is my greatest fear that Americans who actually vote in judicial races will be brought down into the civil discourse and polarization that other races do. If we, as candidates ourselves, don't hold ourselves to the high standard and honor that it is to be a judge or a justice and the nonpartisanship that we do as we take the bench. David, I'll also answer the question on civil discourse. I think you're absolutely right. I was part of a program with the late Chief Justice Tom Moyer on bringing uh, more civility to discourse in Ohio. I think that judges do it in a number of ways, especially us as, a, as those of us who are appellate judges, both in the way that we speak uh, on the campaign trail, but also as we uh, interact with lawyers whether that's on the bench or off the bench, but also in our writing. You know, we, we speak uh, through our words, uh, through our written words. And I think it's important to maintain civility even among our colleagues. And finally, I'll say too, that it's very important. I think the work that we do off the bench and as we meet with the general public uh, to talk about the court and what we do and the importance of the judiciary and the importance of unbiased decision-making. 
and uh, to make sure that we're projecting uh, the right kind of an attitude about unbiased, unbiased justice. And if you don't mind me jumping in, David, I have heard nothing from the three who just spoke with which I disagree, but I fear that no matter how civilly we conduct ourselves, that our efforts are just being overwhelmed by the partisan battle that we see taking place right now in Washington over the replacement of Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, all of us can be uh, can engage in proper decorum, civil conduct, and conversation, but these these are low profile compared to what we see on the news every night and in the uh, newspapers and news sites every morning, it can be a little bit discouraging. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm gonna ask you a question if I may. Um, I know that um, you have a, a challenging docket in Cuyahoga County and you've handled many difficult cases. What was your most difficult case and how, how did you handle it? Well, the one that comes to mind is one that some of your members may be aware of. This is a, a case known as the state of Ohio versus Michael Brelo slaughter of two people in a car that the police had chased over uh, approximately 30 miles in 30 minutes. Uh, dis, uh, 13 officers discharged their weapons that night and one was charged. I had the duty after hearing all the evidence uh, in a bench trial, by the way, not a jury trial of finding that the prosecution didn't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. So I made the decision to acquit the defendant. And there was some dismay, I think, in the community about the decision. But what made it difficult and, and where I think I made an error, not in the judgment, but in handling the case and handling the aftermath of the case, is when I would talk to people, I would defend my legal reasoning. I would defend the outcome based upon the evidence and the law, but I failed to really hear that while they might have been disappointed with the decision, the greater disappointment came because the events in the case were just such a perfect microcosm of current relations between police and some of the communities in our state. And there's a lot of pain there, there's a lot of distrust, there's a lot of anguish and I, in my conversations about the case, I was failing to acknowledge that. Uh, I also didn't readily acknowledge the, the two victims. The fact of the matter is, although the crimes charged were not committed beyond a reasonable doubt that two people died who should not have died, they had families, they had other people who loved and cared for them, and their pain and anguish had to be acknowledged and while I certainly acknowledge that now, there was a time when I was focused on the legal intricacies and people wanted to hear more and I didn't understand that. So that was a, a tough case in many respects. I'll just mention one other component of it that made it tough. When the defendant made the decision to waive a jury trial and have the case tried to me as effectively the jury, uh, the prosecutor opposed that motion. And the prosecutor opposed it essentially on the grounds that the people of the community have the right to decide the officer's guilt or not. Well, in state court, there's no basis for that opposition. The, the legal basis didn't exist. But if I wanted to avoid a tough case, I could have denied the bench trial. I could have seated a jury. And presumably, the result would have been the same. And it would have been off my shoulders, but I couldn't do that because it was contrary to law. So that tells you that I'm gonna do what's correct, uh, not what's easy. Thank you, Your Honor. That was in fact a, a very difficult case and it was in a uh, plain dealer almost every day. So well, I remember. <laughs> uh, Justice French. What is your greatest accomplishment in your legal career? Well, two, two come to mind. Uh, I argued before the United States Supreme Court in two cases, 
uh, one of them representing Ohio, Michigan, and West Virginia, and the other representing the state of Ohio and defending uh, the school choice program of, of the state uh, back as, as it existed at that time. It was a, a wonderful moment, not only to uh, know that I represented the state of Ohio, but that I felt that I was the right person for the job in that moment. Uh, but I have to say that uh, what feels even more significant is the work that I'm doing now, not only as a justice, but as an advocate off the bench. It, it to be honest, took me a little while to, uh, to get my full voice as a justice off the bench and to use that voice to make changes. Uh, I tend to think at a pretty practical level, and there were a lot of barriers to uh, underserved Ohioans and getting them access to our judicial system. And so I'm really proud of the work that I've been a part of along with our legal aid organizations all around the state and now the Ohio Access to Justice Foundation to just make some simple changes uh, in our rules that make it easier for those lawyers out there to represent the underserved Ohioans and also those Ohioans to represent themselves all around Ohio. So I'm, I'm very proud of that and uh, look forward to uh, many more uh, accomplishments in that, in that arena, working with our tremendous legal aid organizations. Thank you, Justice French. A question now for Judge Bruner. Um, Judge, can you describe one instance in which you faced an ethical dilemma and how you resolved it? Essentially, keep myself. Sorry, I've got a note. Um, generally, if 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 I perceived an ethical dilemma, um, I have uh, conferred with my colleagues. I've conferred with court administration. Um, I reviewed the code of judicial conduct and uh, when down, I recused myself from the case. Um, it's uh, that's probably you know, the standard what someone needs to do, and um, that would be uh, actually the best approach that someone could take. Um, and I, you know, I could, I could, for instance, if you recognize, I have a son-in-law who um, emigrated to the United States via Thailand, where my daughter was um, working. Was working. Um, and a case came up where the uh, immigration lawyer that we hired to um, help him get his green card and help him become um, with a uh, marriage visa. He's now a U.S. citizen. As of last uh, December, um, you know, I saw that that attorney was on the case, and I immediately recused myself. Um, and I, I like to think through. Uh, I like to think through um, what may be a particular situation that creates an ethical dilemma, and I would not only recuse from um, that case, but uh, if, for instance. Um, it involves something with a particular judge. Um, I may recuse from all of those judges' cases on review until whatever matter underway uh, would be uh, would be terminated. So that's uh, I think that's probably the best answer that I can give you on that. Um, the only other thing I could say is that there are times when, um, especially on things like a, in criminal cases, on a motion to suppress, there are times when um, the offense is so horrific and, and so offensive, but you recognize as a judge that uh, the, the police perhaps did not um, follow all of the requirements of the law and the Constitution in being able to get to the evidence that they used to try to prove the commission of the crime. And a, a judge oftentimes has to be pretty tough and pretty thick skinned in understanding that you can't have a result oriented decision because it creates bad law. And so there are times when the decision will be unpopular, but you have preserved the right and the case will support that right for the future for the defendants who will sorely need that. Thank you, Judge Bruner. And this is to uh, Justice uh, Kennedy. You know, in politics, we get to vote maybe once a year, once every other year on candidates. But when we volunteer in the community, we get to um, vote every single day in the type of community we want to live in. 
Um, do you believe that voluntary professional and community service is a necessary commitment for a person's holding public office? And what forms of voluntary professional community service have you been involved in? I would say absolutely yes. As leaders in your community, you have the ability to bring in partners, particularly as judges. You have the ability to bring together community partners to solve a problem. I really reconcile it with my work beyond the bench, including when I was in private practice, whether that was serving on a whole host of community boards, um, the domestic violence women's shelter in Butler County, the alcohol drug addiction services, community board, a whole host of other boards, but you also have the opportunity to see problems in your community through the faces of the individuals that come together or come through your court. As a result of that, you have the ability to bring and draw people together to solve those problems. Um, for example, whether on the trial court bench, really recognizing the struggles and the economic down downturn, the loss of employment of individuals, uh, the ability to me to bring together partners, whether it was jobs and family services and other workforce um, partners to actually create a system where you're actually helping those who are suffering from a term of unemployment, obtain employment, whether that community service is tackling a problem regarding um, recidivism within a juvenile population, which I worked on with juvenile court while in private practice. And what I call community service also comes from the work beyond the bench that you can do and actually working with veterans organizations and other community partners to identify how can we make sure that those veterans coming through the criminal justice system, which we call justice involved veterans, find mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment that reach that you have across the state to further that, it really helps you also see other things. So having individuals recognize me as who they perceive as a leader, the disabled American veterans bringing me a problem regarding um, the lack of training or the need for training for judges on the distribution of disability benefits, writing a continuing legal education program on it answering a call for a reentry service system in Montgomery County and really speaking to them and bringing partners together on how to shore up reentry. Having a conversation, in fact, today with CareSource about their database that they use in recognizing the population that they serve who's entering the jail system over and over again. And how can we create a community program to actually be that safety net to make sure that they stop that recidivism? How do we partner with other individuals to make sure there's a safety net that as they leave jail, their services are restored and they actually then are living in a situation that helps, whether that's mental health issues or health issues or substance abuse. We're all leaders as we are judges and have the ability to partner in the community. So for me, those organizations or those needs that I can see and identify in the eyes of the people who have stood before me throughout my career, those are the community things I want to work on. I'm going to make a difference across Ohio. Thank you. Uh, this question is for all the candidates. Um, who are you, your judicial role models and why? Well, for me, um, that's an easy one, David, and it's uh, the late Chief Justice Tom Moyer. You know, he was somebody that you could describe as really smart, always prepared, uh, always um, very thoughtful in both the way that he handled himself on the bench and in his decisions. But just as importantly, he was a wonderful human being and he cared very deeply about the professionalism in the legal practice and worked diligently to bring more professionalism uh, into the legal profession. And uh, so I think for both of his work on and off the bench, he is my role model. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> Judge O'Donnell? Well, I'm gonna go with somebody that uh, you likely might not know. Judge William Coyne served on the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas for, uh, I wanna say 12 years, it might've been a little longer. Uh, 
you wouldn't know it to uh, observe him, but you couldn't figure out whether he was a Republican or a Democrat. All you could tell was he was civil, he was decisive, he was uh, polite to the people before him, and he did what was right instead of what might have been popular when those two clashed. And uh, personally, I'm partial to him because uh, my grandfather and his father are from the same tiny crossroads in Ireland almost 100 years ago. So I am pleased to have succeeded to his docket. And uh, I'm uh, proud of him in that regard, and I hope I can make him proud. Judge Kennedy, who's your role model and why? I would say it would be um, Judge Creham. He was the general division judge I clerked for while I was in law school, but he was also a criminal defense attorney that was in the practice while I was a police officer. So I had many contacts with him, both professionally as law enforcement officer, criminal defense attorney, but also really working with him in the court every day. He exemplified to me uh, personal integrity, caring deeply about the people who came to him, really taking to heart the difficult job of individual sentencing, what was the right thing to do for the individual standing in front of them, trying to make sure that he was not missing something important in their life, whether or not he had a program available to help care for some of what I call the symptoms of criminal behavior, drug addiction, mental health. But one of the things I truly admired about him was that he was independent. He never allowed political influence or other individuals to influence decisions. He had moral courage as he wrote those decisions to make sure that individuals were really viewed by the eyes of the law. He overturned a death penalty uh, case that became quite the stir and his opinion spoke to why he did that and really talked to the citizens of Butler County at the time that he did that as to why his independent decision making was the correct way. He, he is just someone I truly admire. I actually consider him my second father. He's a great man. Thank you. And Judge Bruner. Who is your judicial role model? Um, I would it, I would have to kind of hybrid it a little bit. Um, having read Justice Ginsburg's, Ginsburg, Ginsburg's book, um, In My Own Words, in 2017, her book was essentially a compendium of all her writings, or many of her writings from junior high school until uh, 2016. The clarity of the writing and her decisions and uh, the conciseness um, indicated how much work it took to distill her thoughts into words that meant something read to the public, but were um, able to be carried forward. Um, you know, a, a lot of people have a, a very um, broad view of Justice Ginsburg, but she was an incrementalist. Um, her desire was always for there to be consensus on the court. And when she first joined the court, there was more of an ability to get more of a consensus, and she 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 wanted to compromise. Um, and it's it's better for the lawyers and for the public um, if you have a, a fractured or disjointed decision that comes out of the court. Eventually, it got to the point where it was there were clear dichotomies on the court, and so she chose to dissent when she needed to. At the same time, I really appreciate Justice Gorsuch because. I have a similar philosophy to his, which is read the plain language in the Constitution or in the statute. If you decide decision on the plain language without trying to interpret it, then do so because that and that that is really the beauty of our Constitution. That what language meant back in the 1800s may mean something different today, but if we can still apply it today, why don't we? Um, because the more that we divert off into some other area and sort of take what's in the Constitution with case law that takes us on a different path, I'm not really sure that we're rendering the kind of decision that allows for continuity, predictability, 
the stability of our law that people depend on. Because um, the work that I've done overseas in Serbia, uh, is observing elections in Sri Lanka, um, teaching at the bar station, uh, in, um, and, and then observing elections in Egypt, Sri Lanka, and then uh, working on rule of law as a USAID expert, um, really has taught me that this concept of rule of law is something that what it does for a society in a, in a democracy is it creates the stabi stability, protect, sorry, I can't even talk today, predictability, um, safety for people, and it ends up very, very well, it creates a springboard for people to be able to pursue their happiness and their dreams. So um, that's where I come uh, in terms of two justices in a public review uh, situation that I hope that I am successfully able to emulate. Great. Justice French, um, what is your general judicial philosophy? Well, my philosophy is one of being a textualist. You know, you don't have to interpret the law if you can read it and apply it in a given case. Uh, I describe myself as a judicial conservative, which is different from being a social conservative, but a judicial conservative is somebody who conserves your power. It means that you stay within your lane, that you don't try to be a legislator, you don't try to create the law, you just try to read it and apply it in a particular case. And I think my philosophy also extends into efficiency on the court. Uh, for every case that comes before us, making sure that we're deciding it in, efficient, in an efficient way, in a clear way, uh, so that uh, when the lawyers and the clients read our opinion and anyone out in the future looks at our opinion, they will know with some clarity what the law is. So I think in terms of uh, just simply applying the law, and I know that sounds a bit like campaign rhetoric, but I can assure you that uh, many, many times every single day, as I pick up a new file, I pick up a new case, I'm defining what is my role? What's my role? Am I going to read and apply the law and stay within my lane as a uh, judicial officer? And uh, what's my standard of review? What's been decided before? And that's what I think keeps consistency and stability in the uh, in the Ohio judiciary. Great, um, Justice Kennedy. How do you prepare yourself for cases involving unfamiliar areas of the law? The Supreme Court hears many cases, anything from tax cases to death penalty cases. Well, it's a great question. Uh, to me, this is the most exciting part of what I do for a living at the Supreme Court because it begins that learning again. You've never stopped learning as a judge. And I prepare myself in that with really going back to what I call the tools of law school, reading the briefs of all of the parties, really dissecting for myself the cases, reading the cases to make sure that they're actually stand for that proposition of law that they're citing them for, but really getting into the statutes, echoing what are those words that they've used in the text? Can you simply apply them? And if it's a scheme, making sure I've read the scheme. In domestic relations work, it is a statutory scheme that is complex and intricate as the provisions really marry together to really help you resolve um, the division of property or custody or support. So I hearken back to those days and read the entire scheme. I also use treatise. So one of the things that I like to begin with when tackling a new area of law is taking home those treatise and reading them, not just in isolation for the issue before the court, but reading the spectrum of the treatise so you really get an understanding of what the treatise is talking about from beginning to end. You might only be looking at one aspect of the law, but the law is really a holistic body. I liken it to the oil and gas cases that we have heard in the past four years. You know, oil and gas cases were not very prevalent in Ohio. It was fantastic not only to read the treatise, but then to read cases from North Dakota, Oklahoma, Texas, even Arkansas, and understanding what those issues or what those um, matters that the amici or the litigants were really talking about, how that had 
really been tackled or addressed across the nation. So I'd like to think that I go back to a classroom and really take a broad spectrum of the law, learning as much as I can. And then I find it very important to talk to my staff attorneys. You know, as a justice, I have three staff attorneys and we sit in the office and talk about legal issues. I love that aspect of really what I call bouncing the law off another lawyer to really talk about the issues, to make sure that you're not missing an issue, that you've actually have a broad spectrum enough to understand that area of law before you start making that decision. Thank you. Uh, Judge Donnelly, o O'Donnell, I'm sorry, Judge O'Donnell, um, during the discussion about your most difficult case and talking about the excessive use of force, how do we address the society concerns about police brutality? That will involve all three branches. As you know, the judiciary takes the cases that come to us, typically uh, on the criminal side from the executive branch. Uh, the judiciary can help by making sure that the standards are dictated by the United States Supreme Court, but they need to be enforced as well. Um, but we also need to acknowledge the existence of the problem and not without being shortcomings in the judicial branch. Something that I do propose on the highest Supreme Court is that the court use its administrative role over all the courts in Ohio to require all judges in Ohio and the key members of their staffs to undertake what we call a cultural competency training. Uh, and this would include training in the uh, subject of implicit studies on implicit bias have shown that bias exists uh, even where not known. Indeed, uh, an explicit racist is a rare person, but all of us have these implicit ways of thinking and doing things that we're not even conscious of. So training of that sort would to recognize these things, be, be aware of them, and therefore to avoid them. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to ask my favorite selfish question. It's how I put together my, uh, my book list. When you're not reading opinions, what are you reading? Is that for me or for all of us? For all, all of you. <laughs> uh, Right now, I can only tell you what's on my book stand now because I haven't opened it in uh, two months for lack of time, but it's the Time Traveler's, uh, time traveler's wife, wife Audrey, Audrey Diffenberger. But whatever I can get my hands on, basically. Judge Kennedy, what are you reading right now? So I'm reading The Color of Law right now. Uh, having just finished um, a couple months ago, The New Jim Crow. Great book. Justice French? Yeah, I had to um, open up my Audible app to see what title. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't read, I listen. Uh, I'm a big fan of audiobooks so that when I'm in the car, uh, I'm not just driving, I'm, I'm listening to audiobooks and I read to escape. So I really love a good science fiction, uh, a good science fiction series and uh, anything that kind of gets me uh, out of out of my my normal role. And uh, right now I'm reading a book called Kilo Class, which is uh, just something a little bit of a a little bit of a spy novel, let's just say. Judge Bruner, what are you reading? There we go. Uh, Judge, I think you're still on mute. There you go. Okay. I, I tend to read on fiction. It's hard for me to find really good fiction. Um, there, there, there was once a TED Talk I watched where the librarian that was speaking said there needed four ways to classify books and throw up the decimal system, and that is basically... Some people like the plot, some people like the character, some people like the place or the setting, and some people care about the prose and the actual quality of writing. I tend to care more about the quality of the writing, um, but I like those other things too. So I, I tend to do better with nonfiction, but 
if I ever get the chance to sleep in on a Sunday, I think my favorite thing to do is to surf on Twitter and the articles that you find in Twitter and just like essentially once you finish one interesting article, just sort of look at the one at the bottom and see what's next and see where you end up because you can find you you kind of cover the gamut. Um, so uh, like Judge O'Donnell, it's been a while since I've been able to read a book all the way through. Um, but when I go on vacation, I usually read at least five. So, thank you. Um, so that concludes our formalized questions for day, today. And I would ask, starting with Justice Kennedy, um, please to make a, a brief short statement on why you would ask for our support uh, to continue on the bench. Well, thank you, David. And thank you again to the Academy and to all the physicians and their staff and the skilled workers. Thank you for what you're doing for families. I would ask for your endorsement again to remain the 154th Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio because I bring to the court that which I think you want, judicial restraint someone who will uphold the law, not rewrite it or legislate from the bench, but also someone who has, like you, a compassionate heart, who sees the needs of people who come into our court system and will bring community partners together to help solve those needs. The reality of our justice system is that when other societal systems fail, it is the justice system that has to pick up the mantle and solve the problems, because in the end, it is us that must address them. Thank you. Thank you. Judge O'Donnell. I have five children, four of whom happen to be competing with me right now for bandwidth resources because they're going to school by internet. But like most of you on this call, a family for me comes first. If I can do at least a little thing every day as a judge on the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas to make the lives of people in Cuyahoga County better, then I'm doing something to make my own kids' lives better. And the same will apply on the Ohio Supreme Court. If I'm looking out for my family, like I think most of us do, and I conduct myself accordingly to try to make their lives better, I have every confidence that I could make the lives and working lives of all Ohioans, including those on this call, better. So thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Justice French. Yes, thank you so much to the Academy and to all of you. Thank you, David, for being our moderator today. I am so grateful that you chose to support me in 2014, and I ask for your endorsement in 2020. My record as a judge over the last almost 16 years is that I want simply to follow the law, to not make it up, to not second guess those policy decisions, but to follow the law. But just like you, uh, you are not just physicians or health professionals, you are also individuals. I am also a wife and a mom, a new grandma, very proud about that, but someone who cares deeply about my community. And so that is what led me to work off the bench toward better access, toward more civic education, for a better understanding of the Ohio Supreme Court and what we do. So it is that both my experience on the bench, but also my efforts off the bench that I ask for your endorsement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Justice French. Judge Bruner. Uh, thank you all so much here today. I uh, respect the people who've been on this call, the, all of us who serve already in Ohio's judiciary, and I respect you as doctors and staff people uh, for what you do for families in Ohio. Uh, I love being in the law. I loved being. A, I've always loved being a lawyer, and I love being a judge because the law is a helping profession. Uh, we allow people to live together peacefully in society, to resolve their disputes in a dignified way. And as a result of being in a helping profession, I understand, number one, that it is my job to do everything possible to work hard, to make sure that I am, am making sure that the law works for people. But at the, at, uh, at the same token, I revere the rule of law and understand that uh, as difficult as a decision may be in making someone not happy, 
that in the end, we are all in this together. And the rule of law is what will protect us and will allow us to carry on and give us the continuity of society so that we can provide for the well-being of our children our, and our grandchildren and our neighbors, our communities. And so um, I try to take a balance to do all of that. So um, thank you very much. I would be thrilled to have your endorsement and support. Uh, but at the very minimum, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak today. Uh, David, thank you so much for organizing this, and I wish you all well and safety in this pandemic. Well, to conclude, I would like to thank all of you. Um, as Judge Bruner has indicated, we are very lucky to have all of you currently serving on the bench. Um, I consider it a real privilege to know all of you, and I hope that our audience really understands that you know, you are all deeply committed to protecting the honor of our judiciary and protecting every Ohioan. And again, I thank you for your service and thank you so much for participating today. And with that, I wish you all well and, and safety. Thank you.